dating coach and relationship expert, Jennifer Hurwitz, and welcome to Doing Relationships Right. Raw, authentic, and insightful, this podcast is a no bullshit look at all things dating and relationships. The good, the not so good, and the what the hell was that? No worries, I've got you, and we'll figure it all out together without taking ourselves too seriously. Here, I'm doing Relationships Right. Hello, hello. Good morning, good morning. This is Doing Relationships Right. I'm Jennifer Hervitz. I'm your host every Tuesday, sometimes on Friday. I don't know, whenever I feel like showing up. But I'm here this morning. I'm really, really, I say this, I feel like I say this every week that I have like the best guest and like I'm so excited. And that, But Dr. Jolie Hamilton is here. And I got to tell you, Dr. Jolie, I have been doing a deep dive into you and I am super, I don't even know how to say this. I'm really excited about this topic today. And I'm going to read a little bit about you before I, before I just go into this, but you are the relation, first of all, you're the, you're the relationship coach for couples who color outside the lines. How about that? That's a great tagline. Okay. I love it. I love it. You're a research psychologist, a TEDx speaker, a best selling author, and an ASECT. A, did I say that right? ASECT? I, I wanted to do that. We should talk about that. I think that's a really cool. I love it. Certified sex educator. Jolie also co hosts the Project Relationship Podcast with her anchor partner, Ken. Jolie's been featured in the New York Times, Vogue, NPR, and The Atlantic. She's spent the past two decades studying and reimagining what love can be if we open our imaginations to possibilities. I love it. Okay, so Dr. Julie, what are you doing? How's it going? Oh, it's going great. And I'm I'm excited that you're excited because this topic scares some people, right? So, but right at the edge of fear is excitement and curiosity. So I think that's where we can all learn. It's not about what relationship style you have to choose. It's about what can we learn from all of them? What do we do? What do we want? I'm one of those people that's a little bit scared. I've got to be honest, because I think that we grow up thinking one person for life. That's how it goes. And I feel like penguins, is this true? Penguins are the only monogamous like animal, really? Is that? Okay. You know what? What a great place to start. Let's talk about (laughs) the zoology of it. Let's get serious. When we say monogamy, most of the time what we mean is serial monogamy. What we mean is one person until the next person. And when we talk about the animal studies that they've done, you know, you could point to swans or prairie voles or penguins and say they are monogamous. And yet... We can also look and find lots and lots and lots of studies that show that, in fact, yeah, but we shouldn't probably apply human rules to the natural world. And I'm not even sure we should apply all the human rules to the natural state of what humans want, because those rules don't fit everybody because we're not all the same. So it's normal to feel that sort of like, ooh, scared, because we're offered one picture of what relationships are supposed to be. But that's not what I see. When I see people in my private practice, I do not see one size fits all working out. I want custom. Custom. Okay. So I'm just going to let you go and let you do your thing because I think people are really going to tune into this because we all want to know what do we do? How can, you know, people are like, well, I'm going to spice it up. I want to bring someone into the relationship. I want to, there's, it's more than that. It's, isn't it? And how does the jealousy get involved? I know that jealousy is really an area that you are just honed in on. Um, And I feel like I think that all the time. I'm way too jealous to bring someone else in. Is that true? Is that a statement that people always say to you? Well, it is a statement. I hear from people all the time about jealousy. My academic research, my doctoral research, and my current academic research is in jealousy. So I am deep in it. And in fact, right, right now, this week, I was taking a fresh look at the data to see, is it true? Is it reasonable for any of us to say, I'm a jealous person? And the research just doesn't pan that out. When we say, I'm a jealous person, what we mean is, I haven't learned how to manage jealousy yet. Because I rarely hear a person say, I'm just an angry person. In this day and age, we recognize that if you struggle with anger, you have something to learn. In fact, anger is probably going to be your greatest teacher. If you count yourself as a jealous person, I would say that in that jealousy, and the envy that's mixed in there, um, in there is actually some wonderful lessons for you. Does that mean you need to bring a third person into your bedroom? Absolutely not. We can work with jealousy in lots of ways. But for people who are looking to play at the edges of what monogamy is and how they might make a sex life or an erotic life or a relational life that really fits them, inviting the third And that third might be in friendship, it might be in erotic experiences, it might be in just starting to play with our fantasies and really share them. And those there might be thirds in those fantasies, right? Inviting the third rather than always protecting against the third 
could actually be an invitation to know ourselves better. I never thought of it that way. I always think like, I'm so judgy, right? And I don't mean to be judgy because, but I think lots of people are really judgmental and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe. And I, I don't feel that I'm a judgy person, but for me, I think to myself, I could just never do that. But then why not? Right. It's, it, you know, it's reasonable for you to think that there is a okay. taboo in our culture, right? In mm-hmm. most Western cultures, there's a taboo against non-monogamy. And the taboo, if you, if you think about what it's designed to do, it's designed to limit your options at sort of a core level, a non-thinking level, an unconscious level. Um, it, we have an incest taboo. It's there for good reason, right? That is there for a good reason. We all agree about that. However, there are other taboos that are put there. And I want to question, I want to question, why is that taboo there? Because one of the things that we know about monogamy is it's not working out for everyone. We know that the divorce rate is high. (laughs) And even the people who stay married, they're not all happy. So if this taboo around inviting more intimate connection rather than just one person for emotional, sexual, physical, friendship, everything. Like we want our partner to be everything. If, if the taboo against having more connections than that isn't, it, what if it's not core? What if it doesn't serve the purpose we think it is? What else it might be doing? It might be that if there's a taboo against this, then we can continue to reinforce the idea that we need to live very separate from each other, two people per box, and don't count on each other, don't have communities, right? Don't deepen the imagination around what it is to really live in an intimate connection with others. It could be that this is really just another facet of the patriarchy, just controlling us. Because we're not just talking about sex. We're also talking about intimate friendship. We're talking about connection to other people. And that's where most people are like, oh, wait, if it's not about sex, wait, I have a best friend. I have a, you know, I have, I have a husband and I have a best friend. Huh. Is that, if we're talking about like polyamory, well, multiple loves, I love my best friend. I love my husband. These two things are not mutually exclusive. So now if I take and I add to that, well, what if there was a physical intimacy that I shared? Because I love my girlfriend. I love my husband. Huh. Well, interesting. What does that do to my husband? Is it actually problematic? What I find is it's only problematic if we don't have the skills of solid relationship, right? And so the same problem that comes up if I have my monogamous relationship, if we don't have good skills, if we don't practice good skills of communication, connection, reintegration, repair, Things aren't going to go well. Same is true if I have more than one partner. You said something that I just want to tie back into this, though. If I if I immediately rule out the idea of inviting inviting more intimacy, if I rule it out right away, I never really get to know what that means for me. So it's not I don't I don't espouse. Um, polyamory or open relating. I don't think it's better than monogamy. But I do find it interesting that most of us never get time to question what relationship structure we really want. We just grow up and we accept it's considered natural and normal to have one partner. If we just give ourselves the time to find out what might be different, what would be different if we spent our 20s and our 30s maybe really exploring and finding out? Um, we might find that jealousy is just one of a host of emotions we have to work with in relationships. Okay. I have a couple questions. <clears throat> you hit the 20 and 30 thing and everyone always makes a joke. Oh, you're a lesbian in college and you blah, blah, blah. Okay. But like, here's the thing. I feel like if you do experiment or, cause it shouldn't, I have so many questions. I don't even know how to ask them, but you almost get judged. And then it, that stigma carries with you into your married, like, and when you find that one person who isn't, let's say that the person isn't, in, doesn't have an imaginative or isn't into that, whatever. And then you talk to them and you say, yeah, well, I was in college. I did, had a threesome, right? But whatever. They judge you for what you've done in your past. It's like, do you see what I'm saying? It's like you almost, what? I just wish that everyone would stop and just, uh, uh, does that make sense? I mean, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Yeah. Well, let's first off, let's just normalize the fact that most people have 
multiple romantic partners throughout the course of their life. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Most of us do. And so you're also touching into retroactive jealousy. Why might someone judge me? Like, why might my husband judge me for the relationships I've had before? It might be that he's feeling retroactive jealousy. In other words, it has nothing to do with our life now. Nothing. But he's constellated. He feels all kinds of activated, right? And it's it's pinging off of stuff in him that he's imagining my previous life, my my previous relationships. That has nothing to do with me. But it is very normalized in our culture to allow that the space for that. Like, oh, it's normal for people to be jealous about. Or, or to be controlling even about your past. But how do you, do you get to be your actual self? Then? Right. Do you think it's because he's jealous that he, that he wants me to do that with him? There are a but host of reasons. Say it? Yeah, there are so many reasons. Sometimes people experience jealousy because they actually are not in touch with their, their felt sense of being in the relationship now. They're actually always living in their anxiety of the future or their fear of what happened in the past, right? They're just not present. So sometimes it's just that. Sometimes there is a real like longing for perhaps I sowed my wild oats really well, right? And there's just, that's just envy. That could the envy is about longing for what someone else has rather than jealousy, which is about fearing that I will lose my beloved connection, right? So I could f- have a partner who's envious of my past and they might use the word jealous, but they might actually be envious. They might be longing for what I had and then start punishing me in subtle usually subconscious ways <laughs> because I have this past. And I mean, I don't think it's I don't think anybody's going to be surprised to hear me say that's not good. But what do we do about it? <laughs> what do we do about it? Exactly. Yeah. Practically speaking, one of the big differences I see in my research when I talk to people who are non-monogamous versus when I talk to people who are monogamous, the biggest difference that comes out of the research is that in monogamy, we don't have regular conversations about jealousy. So we don't have a meta conversation about jealousy. Let's talk about talking about jealousy. Let's bring jealousy in and talk about when I feel those flutters in my stomach or the tightness or the twisting, or when I feel confused or when I feel like controlling. Maybe I could talk about those impulses as if they were totally normal and talk about them before they become so big that I'm acting on them, right? But in non-monogamous cultures, we have whole groups of people who've normalized talking about jealousy. Right, they've opened the door, so to speak, and so one of the things they're inviting in is, oh, um, jealousy is probably going to come up at some point, and so there's this real normalization of just talking about jealousy, and even more importantly, there's a nuanced conversation about jealousy because just because I feel jealous doesn't mean there's a problem. I could just be having a feeling. I have a feeling I'm jealous. My husband has, um, he had a partner for a while that I was intensely jealous of, so jealous of. It had nothing to do with him and nothing to do with her. I was just, for some reason, this particular relationship set me off. It was my work to do. But usually when people feel jealous, they turn their fingers outward and say, you change what you're doing so I don't have this feeling. What I noticed is that as long as I can be patient with the feeling of jealousy, it changes, it shifts, but usually there's this feeling of intensity and I have to change it and fix it now. What if I just slowed down, relaxed and said, I'm having a feeling. And that's where I use somatic tools. I use nervous system regulation. Like I got to get myself (laughs) back to a state of equilibrium so that I can deal with this and bring my whole brain, you know, bring my prefrontal cortex back online and actually deal with this in the way that I want to, because whether you're monogamous or not, acting out in jealous rage, not cool, not, not helpful, cool. No. not relationship building. But I also find that in, mon- in monogamous relationships, the jealousy stems from stuff we don't know, yes. right? It's like yeah. the text we think he's texting or, or she, or we think that they're having an affair or we think, but, but in not in, wait, in not monogamous, am I saying this right? Right. Right. That, you know, you know what they're doing because you invite it in. Right. So it's almost like it's in front of you and you can, there's nothing to hide. No one's hiding anything from you. For me, it's like the jealousy that I feel is when I think someone's lying or cause I don't, 
Does that make sense? Right. Absolutely. This is why jealousy is relevant for everyone, because most of the time jealousy comes up and it's unspoken. It's stuff we think might be happening or we just get like a ping. Like yes, if you tune into it. your body, most people can tell me like where they feel it in their body. And a lot of people tell me it happens in their stomach or right behind their chest or in their throat. Right. So somewhere in this area, they get this like twisting or clenching yeah, and closing throat, and they just like get right fire. Here. Yeah. 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 So as soon as you get that ping, what do you do? In monogamy, it's really common to get that ping and either accuse, right? Like just jump right to a conclusion or to go, oh, why am I so insecure? I'm such a mess. I'm such a disaster. It's all me. I'm, I'm a problem. And right. And then you get, then you're down in the spiral before you even know whether there's anything to actually be jealous oh about because you're right. That's so many of my clients. Secret keeping becomes a norm because we don't have the conversations about it. And most of us don't make really conscious relationship agreements. So we're working from this place of implicit expectation instead of explicit agreement. There's a lot of room for people to have different ideas about what exclusive means. What, what does it mean? Like monogamy is about exclusivity, right? Monogamy is about I want exclusive connection to you in these ways. Most people are going to list sexual right at the top, right? Most people then add to that financial. Like, yep, we're going to be financially exclusive. Um, children, we're going to raise our children together. We're going to own our house together, right? We have these things. These are the ways that we're going to be exclusive. Most people don't say, okay, I'm ready to take a mortgage. Now, which of my friends am I going to include in this mortgage process? We might. We could, in fact, in this market. We might want to think about that, but it's usually monogamy is about exclusivity without ever talking about it. We just, we just say, I'm in this relationship. And so I get all of these things exclusively without ever having to ask for them or make a conscious agreement with you about them. That's where the space comes to have all these assumptions and these fears that will eat away at you. And then it, and then it becomes about these tiny things about like, oh, you know, if he picks up his phone at the wrong moment, who's he texting? Or if she's lingering when she's talking at a party with someone, what's that about? What's really going on? But then there's a loss of words. How do I actually ask that without appearing weak? Now we have another set of problems because jealousy brings up shame for a lot of us. And jealousy is connected to being a bad kid, you know, like not sharing your toys and not being a good sibling, not sharing your parents' affection. So now we might be in a shame spot without ever even realizing it. So tricky. Because now you're, I mean, shame's just like a big wet blanket. We throw over all the other emotions underneath it. And so now you're stuck. Do I ask about this situation or do I not? Do I admit that I'm concerned? What about if your partner never seems jealous? Because some people get upset about that. My partner never seems jealous. They don't even care about me. And now we get into this, like, now am I actually trying to provoke a little jealousy because I want the proof that that is for me? And, but what does that do to my relationship in the long term? Jealousy is such fertile ground for real connection, for deepening intimacy. So most of us move away from it. I want to move toward it and understanding what its place is in this particular relationship. Okay, y'all, we need to talk about the holidays and divorce. It's a stressful time for families, especially when alcohol is involved, and our friends at Soberlink want to help. Soberlink has teamed up with divorce and family law experts to provide information that offers peace of mind during the holidays. For those who still haven't heard about Soberlink, it is the solution if you are going through a divorce and custody case involving alcohol. Whether you are falsely accused of alcohol use or are concerned about your child's safety because of the other parent's alcohol use, Soberlink can help. Soberlink works to keep children safe, and its technology makes it a gold standard in alcohol monitoring systems. Don't miss out on Soberlink's free guide for the upcoming holiday season. Request it today at www.soberlink.com backslash DRR. That's soberlink.com. And it's different in every relationship because sometimes if you you know, say how you feel and you say, look at them, this is bothering me. Then the person gets, what if they get defensive? 
right? And that that's what makes me nervous. If I, if I say how I feel and it's not a safe space and then come at you and then you're wondering why they react to the way that, well, he must be really doing it if he's, if thou dust protest too much. Right, right, right. And, right. Like, and so now, right. <laughs> right. Oh, crap, win. what have I started? What have I done? And so now I want to think back to, Oh, okay. Actually, what's their history with jealousy? And, and we don't have these conversations, but your history with jealousy is going to go all the way back. Researchers can spot jealousy in infants as early as five and six months old. So Girl, this is about crazy. This, this right? is amazing. Okay. Okay. So what do we, what do you, I don't know if I have so many things to ask you. Where do we go? What do we do? Like, do you, do you, do you recommend like, I don't even know where I would start. Like, let's say I wanted to, what if you know off the bat that your partner is not interested, but you are? Does that make you... Let's start with, what do we mean by interested? If, am I just interested in, like, I just want to be able to have the conversations about this, right? Because most of the time we jump into the deep end. I, this is actually, there's two mistakes I see people make. Either they jump in the deep end and they just like rip the bandaid off and tell their partner something that they don't really mean. Like, I want to fuck around. <laughs> like, that's not what they mean. Or they talk and 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 they talk for years, but nobody actually ever tries anything. So if you're interested in deepening the possibilities for your relationship, let's start where we should always start. Let's start with consent. If we start with consent, it means we have to have a conversation about the conversations we want to have. So I want to introduce my partner to the idea that monogamy isn't the only option or simply that I want to get really conscious about my relationships. I like to use podcasts, books, radio programs, anything to help me like jostle that lock open. If it's been 15 years in your relationship and you haven't been talking this way, we're going to have to do something to get consent to actually talk about this because you're changing the dynamic of the relationship just to have the conversations, right? And that's the first step. And that's the one that when when people get that and they realize, oh, I'm going to have to invest time in changing the dynamic of our of our conversations before I get to the part where, hey, maybe I'm getting on a dating app or maybe we're going to a strip club together and seeing how that lights us up. Before that comes shifting the dynamic into we talk about these things. It's normal for us to talk about these things. Because don't you think sometimes the person might be like, oh, I'm not good enough. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So if we go too fast with the conversation, it will probably light up sound alarms in our partner. If my partner wants something else, it must be because I lack something. And so the non-monogamous paradigm doesn't work that way. If you make the shift out of the monogamous paradigm into the non-monogamous paradigm, this is a way of being where we try to always bring to the center that everyone's different. You're you're not you're you're non-commensurable is the way some researchers put it. The, these relationships are all going to have a different tone, a different tenor, and it's not about comparing relationships. It's about just being yourself. In the monogamous paradigm, we we actually bank on being special being different and being exempt from all the rules our partner has about everyone else, right? We're the one that gets to violate their boundaries. <laughs> We're the one that gets, and I do it too. I don't mean to exempt myself from this. Like I know that even though I have multiple partners, I think of myself as special to each of them, right? So it takes work for me to be, remind myself like, yeah, and also that doesn't make me better than anybody else who's in their life. And I got to stay real humble about what my connection, that my connection is about how I show up every day in each relationship. How do I show up? My clients often struggle with this because it, it, it sounds exhausting. What it is, is it's just like meditation or, or mindfulness. What? Show up today. Show up today. What is the world? What is, what is the universe unfolding in front of you? Stop looking constantly over your shoulder. We're looking for how you don't measure up and be here now. So exhausting, but only in the way that it is to be mindful, be present in any relationship structure. Gotcha. It's so interesting. This is all so, I mean, it's just enlightening because when you don't know about it and you're everyone's so judgmental and you can't even talk about it because people are like, absolutely not. That's not. That, right. 
Right. And we're surrounded with cliches and and rough stories. You know, I mean, we Will Smith slapping somebody on stage, right? Like that brings up the non-monogamy conversation, right? The non-monogamy tab- tabloid conversation starts. That's not that's not even what his non-monogamy is about. That was a ma- that's a bad moment. I don't want my bad moments splashed about, but that isn't the non-monogamy conversation. Really, um, and this is why I use the phrase creative monogamy for some people. I say, you might have already decided that you have some boundaries and limits. Let's say that you know sexual exclusivity is like, you really want that. And you're like, I'm not ready to bend on that. Okay. But how about your friendships? How about your intimacy, your emotional intimacy? What about your... um your ability to engage in creative living arrangements. As I were watching the younger generations come up, they are. They're they're not always living together with their partners. No, and I'm not. So <laughs> right. Yeah. No. So right. So creative monogamy really can rely on the same skills that non-monogamy and non-monogamists have been building for so long. But usually they don't get talked about. We just get these splashy stories in our face that make it look like this is hard and messy. And in fact, my life couldn't be more boring. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just a soccer mom with seven kids. Like I'm not like I, my life is boring in so many ways, and it's exciting because I have people in my life who let me be me, and me, I fall in love with more than one person at a time. You know what? And I think after, this is so weird that I'm going to say this. I think everybody has room in their heart for more than one person. I mean, I've. You know, I, and I think that it's hard to even go from relationship to relationship and not continue to love the person that you loved before. My husband, you know, I was married to him for 13 years. I still love him. He's my best friend, right? I mean, I think that we are so conditioned to hate the person we loved once. Does and then our sense? new partner may make us like they may yes. have it as a requirement that we, even if we don't, that we pretend we hate them or that we don't, we can't talk to them or we can't be friends with them or we have to block them. I, oh, I am in that myself. My husband is not my allowed husband. to speak to me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. see, it's, it's like, so yeah. str- and my ex-boyfriend who I, I still have this, like, I just love, he won't speak to me. And I love, I love, he was, a, we were together five years and I feel like I've lost a piece of my body, you know? Yes, so it's hard. that's it. It's really that's hard. It. So that's a perfect explanation for what it feels like. These people are individuals. They aren't exchangeable. You didn't swap parts. <laughs> what you did was you have, you have opened up a whole new part of, of your heart. It's just, and now you come more into being, you become more fully yourself in meeting this other person. And if that relationship comes to a conclusion, that doesn't mean it was a failure. It means it came to a conclusion. Right. That's what I wrote. My new book just came out and that's what I wrote. It's like, it's like, it's, it's not a failure. I, I'm like, congr- people congratulate me. I'm, I moved on. I've got a new, I mean, like, I just feel like a, a better version of myself because I learned so much from that past relationship, but I guess everyone has to heal the way that they have to heal, you know, like whatever you do, you boo, but I didn't want to not talk to him, you know? Right. I, I would like to still, right. but it is what so it is. There's the, so one of the pieces of really um, high quality relationship skills that comes directly out of the non-monogamy conversation that you are doing right now is that we, instead of pri- prioritizing longevity of a relationship, we prioritize how well can you transition between relationship styles? So you, know, you transition from lover to friend, from um, married partner to co-parent, there are so many transitions we might go through. How well do you transition? Look, I'm doing, I'm doing such a good job. You're doing a great job. Yeah. And that is that is like prime non-monogamy skill. And it's one that it doesn't matter. Again, you do you. If monogamy works for you, awesome. Do it. That skill, if you can do your transitions well, then also there's less self-hate goes on because now I don't have to judge myself because a relationship ended. And there can be really a deep awareness of what we learned and what we get to take away. The love is yours to take with you. This is, it's such a fantastic thing. I'm so glad that you're writing about it because that took nothing else away from non-monogamy. That would be a huge win all on its own. Now, imagine doing that in the present moment and just allowing each relationship to be what it is without needing to codify one of them as being the one, the current relevant relationship. Interesting. It's so interesting to me. Yeah. It's, if you just sort of dissolve that particular label, how is it different really? Well, what happens, if you don't mind me asking, what happens if 
is it possible that you're that you love one person more than the other and you want does that explain? Yeah, I, sure. Do you mind if I okay. give you a couple more minutes just to I do finish? not okay. mind at all. No, okay. totally fine. Here's the thing. When we talk about love and we talk about amounts, most people recognize that they can have more than one child or they can recognize that their parents there can have go. more That's than one child. Great right? exa- That's a great analogy. I love that. Right. Okay. Right. So, and you know, it, okay, both are true. One, we don't have favorites and there's just more room and more room. And at the same time, and I remind my own seven children of this all the time, yep, at any given moment, one of them might be my favorite. (laughs) And that is totally true. So true. (laughs) Yeah. And and I remind them of that because I'm like, if you're feeling favoritism and it's feeling icky for you, please tell me that because... Yeah, in any given moment, one of that one of you just did me a huge solid by cleaning the stove and taking your brother to school, and you're just having these really lovely conversations with me, and another one of you is pouting in the corner because your boyfriend just broke up with you, and so I'm having a different experience of the relationship. Remind me that you want my attention. Remind me that you want my attention, and when they do, I'm like, "Oh, cool. This isn't about amounts of love, not really." But it's but in the moment, our behaviors may wind up looking like, oh, I, I totally, absolutely have this, this inequity. But here's the thing. Let's say you do love one partner more. Let's say I have a, um, somebody who I consider my anchor partner. I'm married to him. And we share a mortgage and children. And it's a blended family of children, but we've been raising them together for 13 years. So that's it. Like We are each other's anchor. What that means is it's not the love for him that's necessarily bigger. But I have these commitments, these a priori commitments that mean that when I invite new partners in, or he does, we have to be really honest and clear about the limits that we have of our capability. Like love isn't limited, but your calendar probably is. Like one of my limits is that I don't have any other adults living with me right now Um, until my youngest child turns 18. We just made that agreement um, based on a bunch of things. I have other people, uh, clients in my life who they have specific boundaries around like Because my husband travels, you know, when he's traveling, I do X, Y, and Z for the kids. And so I'm not available. I I can't be that kind of partner to you. That sounds like a co-parenting agreement almost, right? Yeah, exactly. And so the thing is, if they can communicate that to new partners really clearly and maintain the flexibility that is, yeah, but you know what? If your new partner broke their leg and needed you to drive them to the hospital. Even during this time when you're normally taking care of your kids and you'll be doing that thing. Oh, you know what? Their need just rose above my general agreement. And so this is where we get really clear about what agreement making is, how I have to have like my guiding principles and act in good faith in those guiding principles so that I can show up for each of my partners in a way that's healthy and and relevant to what's happening right now. And I think you're talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, but relationships with people who are like serious about, you know, the, the you know, they're not just messing around for one night and they would right? You're talking about people who are really looking for this, you know, ENM, like they want, they want to be. Yeah. They want to be this. fully committed to that as their way of being. And here's the thing. They might go by the label polyamorous. They might say open relationships. They might say ethical or consensual non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, those same people or different people might also just be interested in erotic connection and sure. they might call themselves swingers or they might just, ah, I see. Um, they, may, they may say I'm available for casual dating. That's fine too. You know, I think we've lost the art of casual dating. I, I think mean, so too. Where, where <laughs> we could just where, date. Yes. A lot of people right now say they're into consensual non-monogamy when really what they are is they're dating they're and they haven't dating. found their person yet, yeah. but they're using the label. For me, consensual non-monogamy is about being clear that this is my, this is my code of conduct. Like mine, my internal sense of ethics says, I do not control who my partner partners with. And, and he does not control who I partner with. And it's constant discussion, right? Like that's right at our core. Our guiding principle is growth over comfort. And so some of those connections might be casual and some of them might be really, really not casual. I have a client right now who's struggling because they thought they only wanted casual. And then they met somebody that they want to be more than casual. So now they have to deepen the conversations. What does that mean? If I shift away from swinging into polyamory, what does that mean? Oh, it's a, yeah. It's a, it's yeah, that's a big, big conversation. Questions, right? Big yeah. conversations. And it's, and it's, it's not just one, it's, it's multiple. It's an ongoing time is one of the most important ingredients in having relationships that really dynamically meet the needs of the people in them. Like letting time be an ingredient rather than let's rush and get to the next 
you know, stop point. Yeah. I think you have to be invested in in this. You need to know your person and who you are. Julie, can people, um, people can find you and hire you and you, I mean, this is like, this is your thing. This is my thing. This is what I love helping people do because the transition from a monogamous paradigm to a non-monogamous one, it doesn't look one way. It's custom for everyone. And that's what I'm interested in. If people are interested in this, they need to know how to do it well. And I offer a salon. I offer it monthly. Um, It's called Open Relationships for Smart People. And it's about the five pillars that people need. And they need to have these pillars in place in order to explore opening really well. Because it's not about flinging the doors open and just everything goes or just needing to be cool with everything. No, that's not. I did that. Did that. Don't recommend it. This is how I learned all the things. I started by throwing my life into the garbage dumpster. Don't do that. Um, No, you need to know these five things and then put them into practice. And then I guide people, you know, through a process and it takes time. I like to work with people for at least a year. In fact, my, my program is called the year of opening. Tell us the year. Yeah. It's the year of opening because if you want to have these conversations with your partner, you cannot just set aside a weekend and say, okay, well, we'll go away. We'll have this conversation. We'll come back and it'll all be done. We have to experiment and explore and find out what works and what doesn't. And then we have to give ourselves room and time to grow and change and like let our heart open this way. And so over the course of a year, we intentionally explore together in a small, intimate setting, not a big Facebook group where you're just nameless and, you know, everybody's everybody's trying to make the best of it. This is, you know, groups of five, six, seven, eight couples, not a lot who are opening or individuals who are like, I want... I want this. I want to go that way. How do I do I'm that? Really interested well? too. I would love to know. Also, maybe you'll come back and we'll talk more. But I would love to know how you deal with like telling. Do you tell other people? Do your non? Do your monogamous friends? How do you handle the the stigma? How do you handle their their feedback, their opinions, their what, their bullshit? Like that's another thing for me. Is like I always think like you know when you say to someone, yeah, we're whatever. Like. Do you, do you have to have a community? Do you, can you be like, I'm just so interested in this. Like, how do you, is that part of your program too? Like how you handle it after? Well, one of the reasons, yeah. One of the reasons why I do this in, in a group program, I do private coaching, but the group offers people a sense of, oh wait, I'm not alone. There are other people doing this because in your home community, you may in fact feel alone and coming out is a very real thing that not everybody has the privilege to do. One of the reasons I do this work is because I have the privilege of being fully out in my whole life. And that is not a privilege afforded to everyone. And so having community really, really does help. And the ex- the exploration, like coming out, what if you don't know what you're doing yet? Like if you don't know, like if you're swinging on the weekends or you're just, what if you're what if you're starting to explore um, going to Tantra weekends and that's your opening? Like you're just opening that way, right? Do you need to come out as non-monogamous? Well, no, of course not. But might you want to come out when you have another partner and it's Thanksgiving right around the corner? You might. So how do you do that? It's not required that people come out, but providing support so they don't feel alone, whether they're in or out of that proverbial closet is so important because this is this can be this can feel like the denial of self that really cracks someone if they don't feel like they can be out. Yeah, I think this is amazing what you do. I'm just so glad you were here because this is this is something that I think it really everybody needs to to be able to understand. And Everybody. even if somebody is listening to this and they're like, okay, I listened because I love Jennifer and this is like, but oh my God, no. <laughs> Still, 5% of Americans are currently in non-monogamous relationships and 20% have tried it at some point. That's the same number of people as who own cats. So you know someone who has either been through this or is in this. So just listening to this with an open heart and saying, even if it's not for me, it can be beautiful and it can be... be and it, it's valid. It's just a just valid be, relationship option. But, and just be kind to other people because I feel like me included before I did start doing podcasting, I, f- I was so judgmental. Like I'd be like, oh my God, they're swingers and they have white. But you know what? I can say that and I'm holding myself accountable. I will not. I, I think that it's like everybody needs to do whatever makes them happy. I don't give a rat's patootie. So if you're listening and you are one of those people who's judgmental or says nasty things or uh, stop that, just stop it and be kind. And remember that the more love in the world, the better off we all are. I agree, especially now. So much yeah. crap. Oh There's my gosh, Dr. Julie. Enough. Yes. Okay. So Dr. Jolie Hamilton, uh, where can everybody find you? 
What's the easiest you know what? website? If this was at all interested in this, go to joliequiz.com. J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com. 10 question quiz based directly out of my research. And it'll help you understand where you are. Are you ready to open? Are you, are you completely not? That is my absolute best introduction to just the question. You don't have to want to open to find out whether you could open happily, whether it's mm. possible for you right now. So Ooh, go to joliequiz.com. And Jolie then through quiz. that... Yep. And then through that, you'll find me and you will also be able, you'll be invited to come to a salon and hear about those five pillars. It's really, really simple. And you can also find me on Instagram at Dr. Jolie underscore Hamilton. I followed you. I just found you. Yay, yay, yay. Okay, guys, I talk Julie, about you'll jealousy over there. <laughs> okay, yes. Don't be jealous of each other, y'all. Everyone be nice. Okay, so everybody go follow Dr. Jolie and uh, Jolie quiz. Everything's going to be in the show notes. This was fabulous. Um, I just learn something new every day on this podcast. It's so funny. I think I know everything. And then I realize this is why I do what I do. I love it. Thank you. It's the best part. Thank you for having me. Thank thank you. Wait, you have a podcast too. I do. I do. You, so you mentioned it. You actually mentioned it with, I forgot that I'd given you the old name. So we used to go under the, no, it's totally fine. We, um, we just transitioned. We actually just, my husband and I run this podcast together and we had been using the name project relationship and it was great. Um, and then we decided to double down on our commitment to non-monogamy. So the podcast leveled up just this month. It's now called Playing With Fire and it's about non-monogamy and psychological individuation. So if you are into like going deep dives in relationships, this is absolutely the home for you. Playing with fire. I'm putting that in the show notes too. Dr. Jolie Hamilton, thank you so much for being here today. Everybody do me a favor, go grab my new book, Midlife Priceless, A Dating Coach's Guide to Finally Doing Relationships Right. We'll see how that goes. Oh, here it is. Wait, I'll show you it. Isn't it pretty? I love it. I got to get it for my bookshelf because oh gosh, midlife so dating, man. Oh my God. Hell, it's the work. I mean, well, now if I, I would have known. I feel you though. Like, I know, right? I, I feel you. <laughs> dating, Wait, I polyamorous question. or not. Yeah. Before we go, is there, are there, tell everybody, is there a website or a dating site just there is for poly, for. There are, there are lots of sites. Hashtag open exists, field with two E's. Um, yes, exists. I have that in my book. I actually Yeah, and then, and then there's also, you know, most dating sites at this point allow you to list that you are non-monogamous. Here's the thing. If you are, list it, be honest and upfront. But if you're not, and you don't want to interact with people, just be honest. Like if, if. If you get to be honest and say, that's a boundary for me. There's nothing a non-monogamous person likes more than hearing someone's clear stated boundaries up front. We love that, everybody. Just say what you want. God sakes, everybody. I can, and don't lie. Stop lying, everybody. Oh, don't, no need. Don't get me started. I could go all day. I could go all day. Oh, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Do relationships right. Do something fun today for yourself. And go check out Dr. Jolie at Jolie Quiz, J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com. All right? Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day. Peace, love, and so much truth. Yay. Bye, Dr. Jolie. Thank you. Hey, hey. Thanks for listening to Doing Relationships Right. Don't forget, if you enjoyed the show, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast episodes. And please grab my books, One Happy Divorce and Woulda, Coulda, Shoulda on my website, jenniferherbits.com. And look out for my new book, All About Doing Dating Right, coming soon. As usual, thanks for listening. See you next week. Peace, love, and truth.